This video is part of a playlist on quantum mechanics. You can find the link to this playlist in the description below, or you can click on this. In this video, I want to talk about the Bohr model. I'm going to derive an expression for the radius in the Bohr model. Let's have a look at a visual illustration of the Bohr atom. So what we have is one electron shown over here, and it's got a circular orbit around the nucleus. This electron has a tangential velocity v, and it has a centripetal force f. This centripetal force is what's causing it to stay in the circular orbit. If that force wasn't here, the electron would just be moving in a straight line with velocity v. But that force keeps it in a circular orbit, so it's zipping around over here. It's orbiting the nucleus in the same way a planet orbits the sun. Now, in modern quantum mechanics, uh, the picture is actually a little more complicated. But in the Bohr model, we can think of it as a mini solar system. It's a mini solar system with some quantum mechanical properties. And one of those properties is angular momentum quantization. So angular momentum, uh, represented by L, is actually quantized. It comes in discrete chunks. So the, the angular momentum can only have discrete values. And those are integer multiples of h bar. h bar is a constant, uh, which is the same as Planck's constant over 2 pi. And we actually uh, got this expression in the previous video of this playlist. So now let's use this diagram to derive an expression for the radius. So let's have a look at some of the information that's written on this diagram. We have the charge of the nucleus, which is plus ze. E is the same as the charge of an electron, but here we have a plus sign because these guys are protons. What is this capital Z doing here? Well, Z is the atomic number. So this guy tells us how many protons there are in the nucleus. Hydrogen is going to have Z equals 1. Helium will have Z equals 2. Lithium will have Z equals 3, and so on. The Bohr model can be applied to other elements, not just hydrogen, but it's very limiting. It only really works for elements that behave very closely to hydrogen. So they need to have one outer valence electron. If they have a more complicated uh, behavior with their electrons, then the Bohr model is going to fail. The Bohr model works best with hydrogen. The Bohr model actually explains uh, the emission spectrum of hydrogen. And that's why we're doing all of this. It's to explain the, the emission spectrum of hydrogen. So let's get that uh, derivation on the way. So first of all, what is one fact that we can see from here? The force, this centripetal force that is between the electron with charge minus e and the nucleus with charge plus z, this force is the same as the Coulomb force. So I've labeled this c over here as centripetal. And I've labeled this force over here, Fe, as the electrostatic force. So this guy over here is Coulomb's law. This is Coulomb's law. That tells us the force between two charges. And this guy over here, this is the centripetal force, which we're used to from uniform circular motion. right? Because this is uniform circular motion. It's kind of like a simplified solar system. So let's go ahead and set this guy equal to this guy, because their magnitudes are the same. Keep in mind that these guys are vector quantities. This arrow, this velocity, is a vector. And this force over here is also a vector. And their directions are changing. As the electron zips around in its orbit, the velocity is going to keep remaining tangent to the circle. And this guy over here is always going to point inwards towards the radius, uh, sorry, towards the center of the circle, along the direction of the radius. So if you had a vector associated with the radial distance, that would point in along the same direction as the force, but in opposite Direction. So this guy is actually negative if you use the convention that plus is outwards and minus is inwards. So uh, keeping in the back of our minds that these guys are vector quantities, we know that their magnitudes are going to remain constant because this is uniform circular motion. So we know v, the magnitude of the velocity, that's not changing, and fc, that's not changing, and r, that's not changing either. These are fixed values for a given circular orbit. So let's go ahead and set this guy equal to this guy, because we know the centripetal force is actually the electrostatic force, or the Coulomb 
attraction between the positive and the negative charge. So let's write that down. What we have is the magnitude, the magnitude of Fc is equal to the magnitude of Fe. And what is an expression that we know for the centripetal force? Well, an expression that we know is mv squared over r. Right? This comes from uh, Newtonian mechanics. The v squared on r, well, that's the acceleration around the circle. And this guy m is just there because of Newton's second law. So this actually comes from Newton's second law. v squared on r, that's the acceleration. m is the mass. Mass times acceleration, that's the force. So what we can actually do is set this equal to Coulomb's law. And we can substitute in values for these charges. You might notice that I've put absolute value signs all over the place. This is because I want to ignore the sign. I'm not interested in the sign because I know that these guys point in the same direction. And I know that the value uh, of the magnitude is going to remain constant. So I can treat these guys as scalars. Even though the force is, <clears throat> is a vector quantity that is going to be pointing towards the center of the circle. So let's go ahead and put in the two charges over here, the charge of the nucleus and the charge of the electron. So we're going to have k, that's Coulomb's constant. Then we're going to have ze, it's a plus ze, and we're going to have e. So there's going to be two factors of e, that's going to give us an e squared. So what we're going to have is z e squared. And we're going to have to divide by r squared. This is part of Coulomb's law. It's the inverse square law. And this over here is z e squared. That's the product of the two charges. And k is Coulomb's constant. You can also write k as 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. But I'm choosing to keep it as a, a nice condensed notation because I don't want to have pi's and epsilon naughts floating over there. So this condensed notation is what we're going to use. You might see immediately that there's a factor of r down here and a factor of r squared. What we can do is we can actually write this uh, in a simpler way. We can cancel out a factor of r. So if we remove a factor of r, what we're going to be left with is mv squared is equal to kz e squared over r. So I've just removed one of those factors of r. And this over here, mv squared, that might look familiar. We're going to use that in a later video. We're actually going to use this because this is related to the kinetic energy. If you divide this by 2, you get half mv squared. And that's actually the kinetic energy. So with a factor of 2 down here, this is the kinetic energy of the particle. And we're going we're gonna to have to use that in the next video. But for this video, what I want to do is I want to divide both sides by m and get an expression for v squared. v squared is actually equal to kze squared on mr. So I've got kze squared over mr, right? So we've divided by m, we've got mr, and we've got our kze squared factor. For hydrogen, this z is just going to turn to 1. So we wouldn't even have to worry about it. But I'm keeping the z there because this can also work for other elements. So now what I want is another expression for v squared. Where can I get that? Well, I've got this uh, relationship over here. So if you remember from the previous video, this angular momentum can be written as mvr. So we can write this as mvr equals nh bar. Right? So this guy is just angular momentum. All of the vectors are uh, perpendicular to each other. So we don't have to worry about any sine thetas when we're taking cross products. So it's just mvr. Have a look at this. We can divide both sides by mr. And what's that going to give us? Well, we're actually going to get v equals n h bar over m r. Right? I've just divided both sides by m r. Uh, but I don't have a v. I have a v squared. So what I can do is I can square each of these guys, square both sides. And we look what I have. I have two expressions for v squared. And both of them have r in them. So this is on the way to getting an expression for r. So let's set these guys equal to each other. kz squared over mr. I'll set that equal to n squared h bar squared over m squared r squared. And again, we have the same factor appearing downstairs in the denominator. 
So what we can do is we can uh, cancel out an MR and we can cancel out uh, an MR over here. Now what's that going to leave us with? We're going to have k z e squared is equal to n squared h bar squared over m r. Right, so this is the relationship we have. We've canceled out an MR on both sides. And what we can do is we can move this R to the other side, and we can move all of this stuff, all of this KZE squared to the other side. That's going to give us R equals N squared H bar squared divided by KZE squared M. Right, so we've got the KZE squared down here, we've got the m, and we've moved the r to the other side by multiplying both sides of the equation by r, and we've kept the n squared h bar squared. So what's an important thing that we can see? k is Coulomb's constant, that's constant, z is constant, the charge of the electron is constant, the mass of the electron is constant, uh, n is an integer value, and h bar, that's a constant. So what we actually have is a bunch of constants together, and we have another variable n. So what we can actually write this as, we can write this as Rn, where the nth radius is equal to the first radius times n squared. Right, so I've just grouped all of these guys together. And in, in this expression, R1 is actually equal to h bar squared over k z e squared m. That's what this R1 is equal to. So that's the first radius of the lowest energy level, where n equals 1. Then the next one is going to be n equals 2, then n equals 3, then n equals 4. And so that's what all of this stuff here is saying. So what do we actually have? We have this is a squared relationship with the number n. So R n is actually proportional to the square of this value n. Now that's very important. So the second one is not actually, the second energy level or the second radius uh, is actually not twice as far as the first radius, it's four times as far. So that's what this squared relationship tells us. This over here, this is the first radius. Another important observation is that if you set z equal to one in this expression, you get the Bohr radius, which is about half an angstrom. This over here turns into the Bohr radius if you set z equal to 1. So this over here is the takeaway message of the video. The radius for the nth energy level is actually proportional to the square of this number n. And this number n is an integer. It's a positive integer. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So that's the relationship we got. So how do we get this relationship? Well, we started with a visual representation of the Bohr model. We understood that the Bohr model represents the electron as going around in circular orbits, kind of like a mini solar system. And then we used some special properties in quantum mechanics, like angular momentum, uh, quantization, and we also used some of these classical electromagnetism laws, like Coulomb's law. We combined all this together, uh, we got some expressions for V squared, and in the end, we got an expression for the radius. So the radius comes in discrete values as well. This is a pattern in Bohr's model. It's a pattern in quantum mechanics. These values come in discrete, uh, they come in discrete sets. And they can be indexed by variables like n. So n is just a positive integer. So we'll be using uh, this relationship over here, this squared relationship. We'll be using this relationship and we'll definitely be using this little formula over here in later videos in this series.